My guest today is one half of the husband and wife filmmaking team, Jared and Jerusha Hess, the dynamic duo who gave us Napoleon Dynamite, Nacho Libre in Austin Land, and so many more. They have entered the Academy Awards race with 95 Senses, a short film that is heartfelt tribute to the bodily experience delivered by a death row inmate with limited time to enjoy it. Well, this short film marks the Hess's first foray into animation and heads into the Oscar season being Oscar shortlisted. And actor Tim Blake and Nelson, known for his roles in the Coen Brothers' Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? and The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, as well as his reoccurring turn as the leader in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, lent his voice to the main character, Koi, a folksy philosopher facing his own mortality. And as Koi bids a final farewell to each of his five senses, he reflects on his troubled past and dreams of a vibrant multi-sensory afterlife. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome one half of the dynamic writing-directing duo, Jerusha Hess, and their Oscar shortlisted short film, 95 Senses, to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Man, it sounds like we've made a lot of movies based on your intro. <laughs> oh, I, and, and I only mentioned three of those. You have a very long yeah. history of film. But I have to say, Jerusha, I loved your short film, 95 Senses. And it's actually one of the very few films this Oscar season that left me with a long lingering thought about the importance of life around us. So where did you get the idea for using our five senses for this story? So our screenwriters, they came up with this brilliant concept because it was all part of a nonprofit film organization in Salt Lake City, Utah, where we pair up and coming um, animators with people in the industry. And so we became involved with this program, program called MAST. And, and we knew we had six animators we had to work with or we got to work with. And so our writers, Hubble Palmer and Chris Bowman, they brilliantly came up with this idea of like five chapters uh, surrounding our senses. Wow. Well, when I, when I watched the film and I watched it a few times, uh, did any of you interview any death row inmates in the midst of writing the story? That's exactly right. The writers, they were researching another for another movie and they kept watching these exit videos of death row inmates in um, Texas at one of the largest kill rate prisons. And, and they were just struck with how poignant and often repentant and just, just kind of full of grace, these inmates, you know, meandering thoughts right before the end. So that's where they got this whole idea. Well, was the main character Koi based on someone in real life? Not real life. He was just an amalgamation of multiple people. But, but um, yeah, the script was gorgeous. You know, Jared and I don't usually direct or write such poignant pieces. So it was such a, it, it was just an honor to be able to work on it. Well, something, the first thing literally that caught my eye and my ears was the character Koi. He mentioned a place called Lake Conroe, and I literally live about 10 miles from Lake Conroe, and another 40, 50 miles north is where all the death row inmates are housed. Uh, have you been to Lake Conroe? You know, my family actually grew up, in, I don't know the lake, but we lived in Conroe, Texas for a short amount of time. So I miss the lake, but I do remember several out, outlying towns called Cut and Shoot. You know it? <laughs> I, I know it because I only live a mile from Conroe. That's awesome. So yeah, we share that in common. Yeah, so, so when, I, when I heard Lake Conroe in this short film, I was like, no, it can't be. But then as the story went on, and then knowing that Koi was a death row inmate, I thought, oh, this is all Texas. And, uh, yeah. but yeah, we yeah, have Conroe, there's uh, Cut and Shoot, there's Willis, <laughs> and of course Huntsville and Livingston. So yeah, it, it's definitely a Texas-based type story. But I've got to say something, Jerusa, the storyline was extremely well thought out. 
And even the small mentions of myopia from staring at smartphones yeah. too much, a bit, a bit of an ode to millions who are missing life by wasting their eyesight looking at a screen, seems like a lot of research went into making a 13-minute short film. Yeah, again, these writers are brilliant gentlemen. We've worked with them before um, on several other movies, and and it's it's why we jumped on board to direct this project, because the script was so powerful. Well, what has been the audience's reaction when they see this film? So it's it was always a surprise to me when watching it with an audience. People laugh more than I expected them to. And I think I just grow, I'm used to it. I know what's going to happen. And so people giggle through the beginning and they're, and they're laughing with Koi, you know, his many sensorial experiences. And they even laugh at that moment when he burns the place on fire. And then it's like an, like a group gut punch happens when they find out that he actually accidentally murdered a whole family. And so, I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a painful and beautiful way to watch it with an audience because, you know, each time they're like, oh, but you get a sense of that when the grandma hits him with the book or the magazine. And, and also they're like, what is happening? This is a, this is about to get heartbreaking. Well, I thought there was, you know, there was a little bit of a hint in the very beginning of the film where you see this this window appear in the dark shadows and there's three bars across the window and then it pans over to Koi and then that's when I thought, wait a minute, this is going to yeah. take an unexpected turn and it yeah. did, but I thought the whole film from beginning to end was uh, was a brilliant masterpiece. Thank you, man. We think it might be our, the most important movie we'll ever make. It was it was an honor. All the artists were just gorgeous um, animators. Tim Tim Blake Nelson killed it. I mean, the whole the whole short hangs on his monologue. Well, and, it does, and, and I was going to ask... realize after watching it, like I just sat for thirteen minutes because it feels it feels longer. Yeah. Oh. oh, yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah, it's it's just. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Sorry about that. Oh, that that's OK. That's what that's what post-production is for. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you cast actor Tim Blake Nelson for the voice of Koi. How did he come to join the project? He's such a sweetie. He says in interviews that, you know, the script, of course, is the thing that got him. But he knew that we, Jared and I, would, would just kill it. And so he was so excited to work with us. <laughs> well, you know, the film... But when writing, our writers... Sorry, our writers always always kind of imagined him. And when we read it, we were like, yeah, Tim, Tim would kill this. Well, kind of explain to all of us what the MAST program actually is. The, sorry, say that again? Uh, explain to us what the MAST program is in Salt Lake. Yeah, so it was pitched to me by my producer, Miles Romney. He pitched it. You know, this was all during COVID or right before. He said it would be lovely if we started exporting movies from Salt Lake instead of exporting filmmakers. So it was just a chance to get local in which we love and we love supporting up and coming filmmakers and so we were pumped to, to get on board and then knowing that it was animators and so three of our animators were local Utahns and then two three different animation groups actually were out of the country um but yeah it's just a way to pair uh people in the industry with people who who up and coming well, I noticed that there are different designs used for the animation. And I think I counted maybe at least five to six different animation designs. Why the mixture? Well, that was the fun part. You know, we knew that we were giving the chance to these six different animation groups. or Some were single people, but some of them were teams and, and had several group animators. And we knew each of them had a different style. And so we hand selected each style for each sense.
to give you, you know, just that different feel. And, and yes, you're just, I think you're, I think you, you know, you take in the beauty of each style, but you never are like jarred by it because you have that interstitial of Koi um, reflecting, you know, that hand painted version of Koi that you pop back in and out of. And I think that grounds it. Yeah. And you know, the animation, even though there's, you know, five different styles, they blended very well in with the storyline. Yeah. And that was, you know, we wanted the different styles, but each one had a character they were going off. So they were all, they were all designing off the same character. And so we had an, like, we found a picture online basically of this old guy and we're like, Hey, this is what we want. And then Daniel Brusson, he's the one who painted all of the interstitial koi. He did the first character design and then we sent the rest of them wild. We said, this is what he looks like. Wow. I mean, you know, the film shows us that we take our five senses for granted, especially when we ourselves are free. We never give any thought of the harm that maybe that we are doing to our five senses by not using them to enjoy the world around us. Is your film here to give us inspiration and encouragement to use our five senses in a more enlightened way? Well, you know, that's always the message. I think any parent is trying to get their little uh, screenagers to listen to. Like, get off your screens and enjoy the world. But I think it's a message for all of us, really. But but for me, you know, we made this movie during COVID. And I think during that time, we were all so aware of how short life can be. We all lost so many people. And so I think it's also it's it's also just a tale of, you know, life can be short and let's appreciate and we have it. Well, have you ever uh, thought what our other senses could actually be beyond the five that we just pay attention to? No, this is this is all I never even think about these things, but golly, it better be flight, right? <laughs> oh, abs absolutely. Well, you know, when it comes when it comes to animated films, and especially in this category but with an animated short film. Uh, how long did it take to create this film from uh, inception to uh, finished product? It took almost three years, and that's because everyone was, you know, there was such a small budget. People were working for free. People had to do this on their, you know, off hours. It, COVID delayed a lot of it. So it took quite a while, but animations take a long time. Yeah, I've I've heard that from other an, an, um, animators when it comes to a short film. It can take, after after you write the story, it can take upwards, for some, 10 to 12 months just to get the animation to where they want it to be. Yeah, exactly. Well, how many film festivals has this uh, short film um, appeared in? Oh my goodness, I think it's dozens at this point. So... I just know that's how that's how it got on the long list for the Oscars in the beginning was that it was in several qualifying film festivals and won, you know, the the grand jury award at these festivals. So yeah, it's it, it's been an abundance. <laughs> well, what is it what does it feel? I mean, is this your first film to ever be Oscar shortlisted? Yeah, this is the first one. It's it's kind of mind blowing, but I'm also so grateful because I would love everyone to watch this movie because it's so powerful and I think it it makes us all think a bit. So, what a wonderful way and platform to get more people to see it. Well, yeah, and and it is for me, it's one of the best live action short films of uh, this season, and I want everybody to see this film because it is it is that good from start to finish. And I love short films that cause you to think and ponder at the end. And this one does that. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do, you, have, do you have people who are surprised to find out that your short film is Oscar shortlisted? And then they hear, that, they hear Napoleon Dynamite in the same sentence and trying to figure that out? I mean, <laughs> look, you know... We make funny, dumb comedies, right? But, but golly, Napoleon should have won an Oscar too. Those moon boots, those, <laughs> that dance in the end. 
<laughs> hey, it is. Just it's, kidding. It's, I know. <laughs> sorry. I know that the types of movies are not the same type. So, yes, I think people are shocked that we have made a drama is what they're mostly shocked about. Well, well, does this actually inspire you to look into uh, creating more dramas or maybe a drama feature film? Yes. Oh, we're open to all of it. You know, it just happens to be that we have several indie comedy ideas always brewing in our brains. So, but we're, we're open to anything. Well, how many times a year are you asked why there has never been a sequel to Napoleon Dynamite? Oh man, Fox sure wanted one. They sure begged us. <laughs> well, what well what kept you from we doing just, it? It was ne it hasn't been the right time yet. We made Nacho Libre instead. We just I don't know, you make something so perfect, you kind of want to leave it there. I I completely agree. I you know, I heard that even Will Ferrell said the same thing when he when they found out that the movie Elf was a smash hit. And they begged for a sequel, and he said, "No, you know, leave it alone." Yeah. And and I think Napoleon Dynamite exactly. is one of those famous cult films that everybody loves. We love watching it over and over again. And I don't know if we ever want a sequel. I know, and part of the part of the joy and the weirdness of Napoleon is we were we were students when we made it we were young kids we were so hungry and we had no money and so that movie was made on you know it was made on a prayer basically and so the fact that every shot was filmed because we didn't have enough film stock even and so the whole thing is just a, a testament to getting really scrappy and I don't think we could make it with a Hollywood budget. It would be different, you know? Well, how in the world did you ever get that film uh, to be noticed by the general public? I mean, it's it's not going to be a film with a $10 million advertising budget. No, never. It was all because of Sundance. And so because it made it into um, the Sundance Film Festival, it was then bought by Fox and they just did an amazing Fox searchlight. They did an amazing job uh, advertising and getting it out. Well, it's actually the 20 year anniversary of the film. That's right. Because it came out in 2004. So are we going to see anything special yep, and for that anniversary? I think all through the, I think all through the year, there's going to be various um, events, but this in the next two weeks, the Sundance film festival is showing it again as a, just a, a treat for all those who who go to Sundance. So it's fun. Well, is, is we'll that the film? Out there. Yeah, I mean, is this the film that uh, you cherish the most? It definitely is the film we're most grateful for. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it it's, went... It's pretty special. I, yeah, because I, I believe that it brought in uh, over $46 million at the at the box office, which is amazing for the... Uh, you know, for, I guess, distribution when the budget was so low. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, it was a magical, a magical journey. And it's led to us being able to make, you know, more movies. So we're so grateful for Napoleon forever. Well, we know that uh, the Academy's voting ends tomorrow. And uh, does it make you nervous when they make the nomination announcements next week? You know... I'm not, I'm just so grateful for this. This is blowing our minds that it's made it this far. And so wherever, if we get in, if we don't, it still has been such an honor. So I think, um, I just won't look. <laughs> I'm sure your publicist will be calling you early, uh, okay. when the nominations are announced. So, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll wake you up early to, to, to find out. So, uh, Okay. Oh, what what is uh, what are you and Jared? Uh, is there anything that you're working on special for 2024 that maybe yes, you could we have, tell us? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes, we have a big animated movie that comes out on Netflix in May of this year, and it's called Thelma the Unicorn, and it's an animated musical. It's going to be so delightful. Well, uh, you and Jared are going to have to come back, and we can talk about that brand new film. Absolutely. We'd love to. We'd love to. Well, 
Jerusha, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and to talk about one of the most brilliant animated films I've seen all year, 95 Senses. Thank you so much. You enjoyed that Lake Conroe for me. I will do that. And ladies and gentlemen, the beauty of this film, 95 Senses, cannot be overlooked. And Academy members, this deserves your vote. And as for my viewers and listeners, don't ignore the power of your five senses. Look up and see past your smartphone. Walk in the forest or a garden and smell nature. Give a gentle touch to someone who needs some encouragement. And there is a culinary world out there that your taste buds are waiting on you to explore. And ladies and gentlemen, the Oscar short list short film, 95 Senses, is a must-see, so when you have that opportunity, sit down for the best 13 minutes of your life, and believe me, it will leave a long-lasting impression like it did just for me. So again, thank you, Jerusa, for your time today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you can catch all the replays of our interviews with the top film directors, producers, screenwriters, actors, and more on our YouTube channel, Bond on Cinema, and we're available on a dozen audio platforms as well, like iTunes and Spotify. Thank you for watching and listening, and as for me, I hope to see you at the movies.